something like that. We're not going to call it a tax. Or sometimes it's called an effluent charge, which sounds even better, right? They're all just taxes. For each unit you emit, you pay a certain specific tax. The other way to regulate things is to simply tell people what to do. Noah, you're going to eat five carrots with dinner or else. No stories, all right? No Dr. Seuss for you, even though I'm the one that likes Dr. Seuss. Uh, so we sometimes just tell people what to do, where we're telling people you can only emit a certain quantity or else you pay a fine or something like that. Or we tell people what technology to use. You must scrub all of the pollution out of your uh, power plant emissions by using a scrubber, all right? Well, these all seem like reasonable approaches. These command and control, these non-price based uh, incentives, uh, sorry, don't use the inc word incentives with command and control. These rules or regulations, these command and control regulations, uh, come in three flavors. Uh, they're so-called emission standards, where you tell a power plant you may emit up to a certain number of thousands of metric tons of SO2. Uh, you may not emit more. We will monitor how much you emit, and if you emit more than it, we will either shut you down, or we will charge a huge fine, or we'll make you look bad, or you know, we'll ignore it, uh, depending on where you live. So you limit the actual amount of pollution per firm, which of course requires significant monitoring. Uh, we have something else, which is so-called input standards, where we ban or limit certain inputs to production. For example, uh, coal, while well, many of you may not realize this, but coal comes in many different flavors. Uh, it mostly varies depending on how much sulfur is in the coal. The more sulfur, the worse, right? So lots of sulfur is bad, so we're banning the use of high sulfur coal in the combustion uh, process in, in, in coal-fired power plants. So you can tell people what to use. What do you think is cheaper? It's high sulfur coal or low sulfur coal? And high sulfur coal is, of course, cheaper. But uh, you know, so you have to move people in the right direction. You can move people in the right direction by simply limiting what they may use as inputs to production. The third flavor of these standards come in as technological standards, where you actually prescribe the exact technology that people have to use in their production process. Right? So we require that there be a catalytic converter in every car on the road in California. Or uh, until two years ago, there were a very, very small fraction of diesel-powered cars uh, on the road in California. And they all smelled like fry oil, right? Some biodiesel. Now, all of a sudden, you're seeing all these high-end Beamers cruising around, you know, with uh, the torque, the equivalent of a tractor uh, in California. BMW has it, Mercedes has it, Audi has it, and VW has diesel. Chevy's getting in the diesel business, too. Uh, we tell uh, in California that you have to have a certain uh, level of emissions per mile uh, that come out of your tailpipe in terms of soot, in terms of sulfur, and so on. So the technology wasn't available until very recently to actually meet that standard. You can meet that standard now, so people are in the market to actually sell these diesel-powered cars uh, in California now. It wasn't a technological standard, it was an emission standard, right? You could also do it the other way around, where you say you may sell your diesel-powered car if you have a urea filter on your car. Your real filter, that sounds gross. You're absolutely right. Uh, it's gross. All right. Uh, but the point here is we can tell people how much to emit, what types of inputs to use, or what, technological, uh, what technology they have to use. For example, if you're a big boat, right, you're coming from China with containers and containers full of stuff to California, and you're in the open ocean where there is no law, essentially, what are you burning to power your ship? I don't know, you burn like your house cat, too, right? Uh, so whatever, whatever burns goes in there, really, really dirty fuels. And what happens at, at harbors, if you don't regulate that, is these ships arrive uh, while they're burning like tires and, and all kinds of stuff that causes horrible pollution and people living by harbors, you know, in areas where, uh, you know, it's actually pretty nice down by uh, Oakland Harbor. I think. Uh, but uh, lots of cheap studio space if you're married to an artist. But the point here is uh, pollution levels around harbors were really, really bad. So we now have a regulation that if you come up to California, you can't burn these really dirty fuels. So that's an input standard where we're telling people what they have to burn in order to come near the California coast. Now, for this to be cost effective, you have to get it exactly right, right. And what I mean by that is in order for standards to work, you need to set the standard so you get to exactly Q double star market wide. Right? So you have to know what Q double star is. You have to know what the external cost curve is and what the private marginal cost curve is in order to figure out what Q double star is. You further have to know what the demand curve is. Do you think the California regulator knows what the demand curve is, what private marginal cost, and what the exact value of marginal external cost is? No, right? We generally don't. So getting the answer exactly right using standards is extremely difficult and requires a lot of knowledge. So what do we use? Yeah, so, so this is, for those of you who saw the Lego movie, the 1980s Lego spaceship guy goes, spaceship, spaceship, spaceship is great. Uh, so I at home go, taxes, taxes, taxes. Taxes here are great. Why are taxes great? Uh, they, they correct the externality, right? So I showed you this last time a little bit, but let me do it again. So I don't know if I told you my new insight from marketing. I went to a marketing seminar, and these people say everybody in marketing knows is that if you want people to remember what it is you say, you have to repeat it seven times in seven different ways. I can't do that here, right? But twice or three times actually works pretty well. So if this is my supply curve, let me use my ruler. This is the demand curve. And let's do this with our new marginal external cost curve here. Then the social marginal cost curve is something like this, SMC. Right? The market left alone, bless you, will produce right here, P star. But we want the market to produce less and charge a higher price. So this is what the market will do if left alone. This is what we want the market to do. So what we want is we want the market to voluntarily produce uh, at an output level that is lower than the one the market would have chosen on its own. We know that the answer to that is going to be taxes. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge a specific tax that shifts up the supply curve or the private marginal cost curve exactly to the point. Uh, that's not exactly right. Let's get that exactly right here. Shift it up. So this is S plus tau. So this is shifted up by tau dollars, such that the supply curve, private marginal cost, plus the specific tax rate gets you to exactly the price and the quantity that is socially optimal. Right? So you charge a specific tax that turns the firms, or all the firms in the market's private marginal cost curve, into what we think is the social marginal cost curve. So while the firm will never directly compensate the kids that are missing school days, or the, people that are, or the families of the people that drop dead because of air pollution, what we can do is we can figure out what the external cost is, and collect it from the firms, and then we redistribute it as, as government to, you know, in whatever ways we, we feel is, is right. Okay? But the key insight here is that by shifting up the private marginal cost curve, using a tax, this here is tau, that tax right here, 
is going to be exactly equal to the marginal external cost at Q double star. Right? So the tax rate here has to be exactly equal to whatever the external cost, marginal external cost at the optimum is. Right? All this damage that the firm is imposing on the environment that it's not privately paying for, we're making them internalize this cost, meaning paying for it via a tax. Right? Because as a government, I have the right to collect, well, maybe yeah, the ability to collect taxes. All right? This is a pretty cool insight, I think. So you take the external costs and you simply turn around and make governments charge the firms for these marginal external costs in the form of a tax and then redistribute that in whatever way uh, the government sees fit. So what do we like about taxes? They're efficient, right? Question in the back. This one right here? Let's do the Alzheimer patent at zoom lens. Okay, so this says tau equals mar marginal external cost at Q double star. There's no new marginal external cost curve here. This is my zoom lens, okay? This is like one of those uh, things. Okay. And if you didn't catch that, it's on webcast too. Uh, the zoom lens, trademark. Uh, so what do we like about taxes? They're efficient, right? They get us to the socially optimal output level and price. They maximize welfare. They maximize the size of the pie. Do you think the firms paying the tax are going to like it? Yeah, firms love paying taxes. That's why they never fight new taxes, right? No, the people having to pay more of the tax aren't going to like it. Are consumers going to like the higher prices? Do you love paying more for gasoline? No, right? But in the grand scheme of things, there's some people who are using or producing the commodity that's being taxed that are going to dislike it. But do you think the kids that are you know, now home sick from school because the air pollution is so bad in their neighborhood really like the cleaner air from a cleaner environment in the harbor neighborhoods? Yes, right? So some will win, some will gain, but what we're, uh, some will lose, some will gain. But the point here is that overall, from a societal point of view, it makes us better off. So one thing you could do, and this is uh, pretty neat, uh, we know that in a perfectly competitive market, right, if you tax, uh, if you impose a tax that's distortionary or causes dead weight loss, do we tax things that are goods? Is income a good to you? You like income. Do we tax your income? Pretty significantly, right? I just wrote a check. It wasn't pleasant. I'm doing my part. I'll pay it. I won't mind. But still, I would have rather gone to Hawaii six times. Uh, uh, but the, the point here is uh, we can show that there's lots of taxes we charge that are actually not efficient, right? Uh, income taxes, we've always well, we've collected them for a long time. We know how to do it. But generally speaking, they're not necessarily efficient. We do know, however, that not charging a tax on air pollution or carbon uh, is inefficient. So lots of people are fighting carbon taxation, for example, on the grounds that it's just another tax. We're going to have to pay more. And the government is reaching into our pockets and extracting ever more money out of our pockets. One argument here is pretty neat, right? That says, okay, let's charge a carbon tax and move us into a direction where we're burning less carbon, we're a more efficient uh, economy. But what are you going to do with all that tax revenue? Well, you take it, and one argument here is to offset some of the distortionary taxes. So cut people's income taxes. I'm not advocating that this is always the best thing to do, but I'm saying in certain settings, if there are distortionary taxes, such as income taxes or other types of taxes that you think are too high and inefficient, you take that revenue and you lower these other taxes, right? You incentivize people to work more by punishing them less for working and getting that income, but you're creating disincentives for burning carbon, right? So you're doing away with inefficient taxes and you're ramping up efficient taxes. So for example, there's one uh, movement in the US right now which is arguing for a significant carbon tax. I'm sorry I keep on talking about carbon. It's not because I think that's the most important issue. It's the issue I know best. Uh, so they're arguing we want a carbon tax, but we want a revenue neutral carbon tax, right? So what that means is we're going to collect a carbon tax, but we're going to redistribute it to households. Uh, either on the utility bills or when it's income tax time. All right? So the nice other thing about taxes is if a firm has to pay taxes by, because it uses very dirty production processes, being dirty is all of a sudden now more expensive. Right? So being a, a, an inefficient, smoke-emitting producer is costly because now you're all of a sudden paying these taxes. So the incentives for firms to come up with uh, ways to produce output more cleanly, where maybe the marginal cost of that new technology is lower than the tax fee, are set up correctly. Right? All of a sudden you have a higher reward for actually innovating in more cleaner production uh, processes. There are drawbacks. All right? so, the notion here is uh, the regulator almost never knows how much you get in reductions for a given tax. Right? You don't know how consumers will react in the long run to gasoline that costs a dollar more. Uh, will they actually drive less? Will they invest in smaller cars? Or is this one of these things where you know, we've always driven big cars, uh, we will drive the same number of miles, it'll just cost more and it'll crowd out other consumption. So the notion here is the regulator doesn't know how much emission savings you're going to get for a given tax, uh, specific tax rate. And that leads a lot of people who worry about the physical environment uh, worried in the sense that we would like to know with certainty how much better the environmental quality will be after we charge the tax. Uh, the other point here is that firms have to pay taxes on all non-abated emissions. So you don't just pay a price uh, on uh, emissions over a certain minimum threshold level where we think it's bad, but you're actually paying a tax for the first unit, the second unit, the third unit, the fourth unit, the 9,000th unit. So you pay for all units, not just the ones past some threshold. And that for many firms that use significant amounts of a certain input that we're now going to tax may lead to a huge tax bill. Right? Owners of coal-fired power plants, potential tax bill from a significant carbon tax is potentially massive. Right? Same thing goes for companies like refineries. So very hydrocarbon intensive uh, firms are clearly exposed to a big carbon tax. Okay. So we don't usually do this in an undergrad class, but I want to introduce you to a concept which I really like. All right? Don't have you ever seen a picture of, of coast? All right. Yeah. All right. Yes. Question. So th 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 that's a really cool question, and that's a discussion we could have for a very long time. So let me take a certain interpretation to that question. If that one's not right, feel free to stop me. So let's say there's a set of firms that are raking in profits of you know, tens of billions of dollars every single quarter, and you know, we raise the cost of production and fines by you know, a million or two every quarter, and this is just noise to them. It won't affect their, uh, their behavior. Right? So if you're going to affect firms' behavior, the optimal fine for violations uh, from uh, you know, the optimal fine for violations of certain laws has to be you know, proportional to the damages it, it causes. Right? So the notion here gets really, really complicated depending on uh, how likely you think it is for a firm to engage in certain violations, right? how big the damages from the violations are on society. Right? If there's a big, really wealthy firm that causes violations in one area and the damages aren't very big, right? it doesn't make sense to punish a firm with you know, huge, huge fines when the damages are very small. So the fines should always be proportional to the damages in, in some sense, no matter what the size of the, the firm is. The bigger question here is, uh, 
the political economy of it, of course, is more tricky, right? Fines and regulations are endogenous, right? So lawmakers pass laws. Uh, if you've ever looked at how the sausage gets made, how actual regulations get written, it's really complicated. I would encourage you to go to DC and you know, do an internship, go do some UC DC stuff wherever you want, uh, and you will learn uh, things that are really quite interesting, right? Firms hire lobbyists that then help get laws passed or modified in ways that is actually less worse for firms than what we think is optimal. So bigger, richer, wealthier firms, of course, have a bigger war chest to influence legislation. Sometimes they get somewhere, right, uh, with certain regulators. Sometimes they don't. They don't, right? There are certain regulators that are just blind to or deaf to requests from certain industries. Others aren't. But that gets into the policymaking. Uh, process. And I think that's really interesting. And that's why political economy is, I think, a major choice here, right? So it's, it's exciting and depressing at the very same time. But let me, so, so this is what a Nobel Prize looks like. Okay, so if you get a Nobel Prize, you get one of these coins made out of real gold, all right? And then you get one that's gold plated. So the real gold one goes in your safe and the gold plated one goes on a nice chain around your neck, all right? That's where I would wear it every single day. Uh, actually, I think I may get one of those, you know, flavor plate has these amazing things around it, a really big one. Uh, so the, the point here is, uh, this idea was so neat that somebody got the Nobel uh, Prize for it. Uh, so let's talk about what I'm thinking about here. The notion here that I'm about to explain to you is not one about optimal policy design necessarily, but one about how important it is to define property rights properly, right? So if I walked up to Fiona, I really like that, you know, she's got like a red Mac. I've never seen that before. That seems cool. I'd like that. I'm going to take it and I'm going to start working with it. You know what would happen? Fiona would get very angry. Uh, she would go to my chair and my chair uh, would come to me uh, and fire me probably, right? Even though I have tenure, I'd still get fired for stealing a GSI's computer. That's not okay. So the point here is uh, what we have in the United States, for example, is some pretty well-defined property rights, right? Fiona has paid for that computer or is paying it off currently, but she has a property right to the use of that computer, right? You have a well-assigned property right to the use of whatever it is you own. And if somebody else takes it away from you, you can go to the police and the police will try and help you get it back, right? Uh, so what a property right is, is an exclusive privilege, a right to use an, an asset. So the Coase theorem, oh, by the way, this guy, Ronald Coase right here, uh, amazing economist recently passed away, if, if, if I recollect at the age of 100 something, absolutely brilliant man, published books until the very end of his life, just a, a true hero uh, to economists. But the Coase theorem says, and this is something uh, that you'll study a lot in graduate school if you get interested in this, that the optimal levels of pollution and output result from a bargaining between polluter and their victims if property rights are clearly defined. Whoa. This is big, right? So anything in science that says theorem on it is usually big. So what the Coase theorem here says is we will get to the efficient level of pollution and output, so production and damage, from bargaining between the polluting person and the victim if property rights are clearly defined. So let's think about the setting earlier, right? Where you have a power plant somewhere, let's say near the Grand Canyon, that's producing a lot of coal, uh, electricity from coal, and there's lots of pollution dripping, drifting westwards and eastwards and affecting households thousands of miles down the road, right? So can the uh, polluter and the victim uh, bargain really well here? No, right? You probably don't even know that you're missing school because of air pollution. You're just not feeling well, right? And you don't know where the air pollution comes from. If you're in California, uh, a bunch of it comes from here. Lots of it in the Bay Area and in the LA area comes from ships. You'd be surprised by how much air pollution comes from ships, cars, and a bunch of it's now coming in from Asia. Uh, that's also really amazing. I can show you really cool satellite pictures if you want to see those. But the point here is this is a setting where we worry about this at a large scale. It's very tricky to get people to be able to negotiate with each other. So the other point here is uh, parties generally don't have to attempt to negotiate unless the property rights are well defined, right? Are you going to argue with your neighbor if there are no established quiet rules in your neighborhood? Yes, right? I'm with you, Lars. Right? I'm going to be at that person's door, and you're going to be quiet, uh, or I'll send Lori your way, and then you're in real trouble. Uh, but uh, the point here is, generally speaking, people are more likely to negotiate if they have the right to something. Right? So if your neighborhood has a rule after 10 o'clock, it's supposed to be quiet. I'm sure dorms have the same thing. If your neighbor is playing Skrillex at 10.15, you're going to go next door and say, 10 o'clock is quiet time. Turn that stuff off. That's not even music. All right? So parties generally don't negotiate unless property rights are clearly assigned. All right, let's think about this for a second here. Now, here's a new way of looking at the world. This is called a payoff table. Okay, let me show you how to read these things and then set up the example that I want to think about here. This is Jeff Perloff's example and I just think this is a really beautiful example of looking at the world. Think of a lake, all right? No, lakes aren't red. Well, there's a really scary report of Chinese water pollution that came out this week. Okay, here's a lake. It's pretty, isn't it? Okay, here, what is he doing now? Oh, don't just wait. Okay, here is an evil chemical firm. It has a pipe that pumps stuff into the lake. It just smells bad. It doesn't kill fish. It doesn't do anything else, but it smells really, really terrible. If you've ever been to Yellowstone, it looks beautiful, but the place, you know, smells a little bit. Okay. And then this is a boat. Let's stop it next. Okay. There's a lake. There's a firm that pollutes, uh, pumps stuff into the lake. Uh, it just smells bad. And there's a boat rental company at the other end, right? If you're going to rent a boat and you're going to row with your loved one on the lake, the last thing you want to do is have a smelly lake, right? 